Welcome everyone to Learning in Lakota, a panel discussion hosted by South Dakota News Watch, the state's only nonprofit journalism organization. This hour long discussion is the latest in the ongoing South Dakota Matters series of statewide polling and panel discussions hosted by News Watch. I'm News Watch content director Bart Van Cook, and I'll be moderator of tonight's discussion. Viewers on Facebook Live are encouraged to submit any questions for the panel in the chat function on the Zoom format. Now let's get started. By almost every measure, the South Dakota public education system is failing to serve and properly educate Native American children across the state. South Dakota has about 15,000 Native American students attending public K through 12 schools, and they trail their white peers and members of other minority groups in all, uh, almost all measurable metrics. Native students on average are well behind their public school peers in math, English, and science proficiency. Certainly, there are success stories among Native American students who've had high achievement in traditional schools and gone on to very fruitful careers and lives. However, overall, Native students have lower high school completion rates, lower levels of college and career readiness, and in perhaps the most troubling metric, they have nearly triple the rate of chronic absenteeism compared to white students during the pandemic. Now the data in South Dakota and across the country is clear that income level plays a critical role in student achievement. And Native Americans in South Dakota, like other minority populations in the U.S., on average earn less than members of the majority population. Understanding and undoing the consistent achievement gap between white and minority students in public schools in South Dakota and in the U.S. is a complex, complicated issue, but one that many education experts argue absolutely demands attention, action, and innovation in order to level the educational playing field. It's no overstatement to say that without educational equity, without a fair shake for all students, that the future of individual children, the stability of families, the collective strength of communities and entire populations are at stake. In South Dakota, a growing movement is taking shape to examine and reform the public education system to increase equity, fairness, and inclusiveness for Native students. Many experts are looking toward an, an Indian immersion model, as, which has shown, shown success in other states and in the few places it's being tried in South Dakota. In a general sense, the research shows that minority students feel more comfortable, more accepted, and more engaged when they see themselves in the curriculum and in the classroom, where they can relate to other students, teachers, administrators who look like them and have shared experiences, and they respond better to approaches that reflect a supportive view of their culture and history. In the ongoing 2022 South Dakota legislative session, some lawmakers and advocates proposed for the third time that the state allow for creation of a few state-funded charter schools in which students would be immersed in Lakota Indian language, culture, history, and teaching. And for the third time, the bill failed this week in the House of Representatives. Tonight, South Dakota News Watch has gathered together four experts on education and the Native American experience in South Dakota to discuss how education can be improved for Native American students in our state, to share experiences and knowledge about what is and what isn't working and why, and also to examine what comes next in the movement to increase opportunities for immersive education in South Dakota. Let me introduce tonight's panelists. Senator Troy Heinert, Democrat from Mission, is the minority leader in the Senate and was the prime sponsor of the Lakota Immersion Schools Bill that was defeated this week. Matthew Cool is a national ed educational consultant who works on native education issues from his home near Belfouche, South Dakota. Sarah White's a former Indian education specialist with the Rapid City School System, who's now the director of the South Dakota Education Equity Coalition headquartered in Rapid City. Also, we have, uh, may have later with us Sage Fastdog. He's an educator on the Rosebud Indian Reservation and head of the private uh, Lakota Immersion School on Rosebud. So to get things started, I'd like to start with Senator Heinert. Senator, I just wonder how, uh, if you can share the motivation behind Senate Bill 139, um, why you think it failed and how you're feeling today, uh, a day after the news that uh, this bill uh, failed again and Correct me in, if I'm wrong, but what is expected to be your last term in office as a state senator? Well, thank you, Bart. Um, you know, I guess as to why, what was the, the genesis of, of where this bill came from? Um, you know, I taught school for 10 years, taught elementary school in Rosebud. Um, and I saw that, that the things that we were doing, we needed to do more because as we could get kids through elementary school, as they got towards middle school and high school, then we lost them. And I just couldn't, I couldn't take that anymore. I couldn't see that happen in our communities. And it was, wasn't just happening in my community, it was happening in other areas of the state as well. Um, you know, Senate Bill 139, um, 
I, I can't thank the, the proponents of this enough. Uh, we've, we've all put in a lot of hours. And I really thought that uh, we had the momentum this year. I thought now was our, our time. We were going to uh, get this through. Uh, you know, unfortunately, it got over to the house. Uh, the education groups uh, that opposed it did a good job, I think, of of creating confusion. You know, in the in the house committee, um, we had former supporters of this bill uh, switch to uh, opposition. Um, so I was a little perplexed, um, and as as sad as I was yesterday uh, after that vote, because uh, I thought, you know, what, what could have I said? What could have we done more? Um, today, I realized that things happen for a reason. And uh, there'll be a time when, uh, you know, this is going to be the norm. And districts are going to look to us uh, to be leaders in what we can do uh, for Native children in this state. So, you know, I'm optimistic. Um, you're correct. I, I'm not uh, currently seeking another office at this time. So, uh, but I think we've laid some really good groundwork. Uh, and I know uh, the people that I share on the, uh, the panel with tonight and others are, are going to take this and, and keep going. We're, we're not going to give up. We're a resilient people. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to turn to Ms. White. Uh, Sarah, I wonder, uh, it, you're committed to equality in education. That's the name of your coalition that you lead. Um, I wonder if you can explain what educational equity is, why it's important, and what barriers you see that exist right now uh, in terms of uh, um, Native student uh, achievement in the South Dakota public school system. I think equity for Indigenous education in South Dakota would first and foremost um, deal a great deal with a level of inclusion. Um, currently with movements like um, Executive Order 2019-1, in which moved the Office of Indian Education from the South Dakota Department Ed of Education and placed it under tribal relations, so was successful in disenfranchising the voice of our tribal education leaders um, and experts in the field who work directly with students on a day-to-day -day basis, effectively further marginalizing our students. I mean, um, equity to me would be that students would be able to have an unapologetic space in our publicly funded institutions um, in which the, their mere existence is reflected. Um, they have access to language, culture, and other opportunities that reinforce their, not only their heritage, but their sense of identity. Um, and that is the baseline for what equity would look like for our Indigenous students. And what are the barriers to that happening now on a more regular basis in South Dakota? Um, a, the disenfranchisement. Um, B, when we think about the opposition, if we look at the SB 139 process, in addition to um, SB 68 and SB 66, um, the opposition really, I mean, we, for instance, one of the key ones for me was, um, I'd like to preface with by saying that I'm a mother of four sons who are enrolled in the public school system in South Dakota, and that effectively makes me a stakeholder in some of these more verbal, verbal and vocal districts who oppose this bill. And um, we were questioned about what consultation was done in direct consultation with school districts, but my question to them would be how many superintendents consulted with indigenous communities before they enforced their opposition to this bill? Because my guess is um, slim to none. I think having our voice absent from a lot of these discussions um, keeps us from starting the building blocks of what equity could be. Yep, thank you, I appreciate that. Mr. Cool, you uh, work for um, a, a group trying to expand the model of the uh, Native American uh, Education Academy, uh, if I have that right, that uh, um, from uh, um, uh, from uh, New Mexico, can you tell us what immersion uh, uh, Lakota immersion would look like? Can you explain for people who are uninitiated with that concept what what that looks like on a on on sort of a classroom level or a ground level for a, a school to embrace uh, and and engage in that? Sure, so I just wanna be clear. I work for Native American Community Academy Inspired Schools Network. 
our aim is not to uh, expand NACA, which is the flagship school of the group that I work with to other areas. It's for communities to generate a solution to the educational challenges and the opportunities that they want to see occur in their communities. We're not trying to take a one size fits all cookie cutter approach to this. So in some instances, like on the Rosebud Reservation where Sage Bass Dog operates Wakanyeja Tokeachi, the decision was made that a immersion school was what fit his students, his families the best based off the input that they had had from the community. So these are spaces where students would still be um, responsible for learning state standards, science, math, social studies, reading, but they would be doing that through an indigenous lens. Far too often, as Ms. White said, we see that there's erasure of native students, indigenous students uh, from the curriculum in schools, wherever they are in the state of South Dakota. And really the idea would be that we would be in the space to celebrate uh, indigenous genius through cultural excellence and academic relevance. But I think more so what I show up for in support of the South Dakota Education Equity Coalition, Senate Bill 169, 68 and 66 prior to this is as a parent and as a South Dakotan. It's my job to prepare my son for 2050 and not 1950. And too often I see an education system within the boundaries of this state really doing a disservice to young people who are going to be asked to experience and navigate uh, a global economy as time changes. Thank you. It looks like uh, we have Sage Fast Dog with us. Uh, I don't uh, see his image, but Sage, are you with us? If you can unmute. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, thank you. So I wanted to know, uh, um, uh, and I appreciate you for clarifying, Mr. Cool. I, I, I we spoke as a, uh, I interviewed you as a uh, resident of South Dakota and not as a an educational expert uh, for my story. But uh, Mr. Fast Dog, welcome to the conversation. I wonder, can you provide us a brief snapshot of uh, your school on Rosebud, the educational approaches being taken there, and what kind of outcomes are you seeing for the children in your school? Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> so. Um, brief snapshot, we're, um, we're an elementary school. We're developing up to be a K-5, K-5 school. Our, uh, our curriculum is all, uh, is all, um, <clears throat> aligned to, um, common core standards. We do in our, in our school, we got kindergarten. We started out with kindergarten last year with nine students. And then now this year we're up to 20 students. So we have about 11 students in first grade and uh, 10 students in uh, kindergarten. And so, and then our kids are, they're progressing to this academic output, you know, they're, they're reading and reading and writing in Lakota. And they're, and naturally the indigenous language adds, um, you know, it's mathematical. So kids are taking off in math. I mean, they're, they're already multiplying in, um, in first grade and kids in um, kindergarten are already learning how to subtract and um, with, um, um, single digit numbers i got one two of them that can do um double the double digit numbers and <clears throat> they can count she's all the way up to 100 they've been catching the concepts of um, counting by hundreds by tens um they get up to a thousand so it's you know they we, we created a place and designed a place for kids to learn and and, and also be um relevant to uh to the the area that we're um we opened it. So it's natural that we have a um, Lakota immersion school. And at the same time, we're thinking, we're thinking 175 years out, you know, we want to make sure that this school is going to get our kids to be academically prepared, to be holistically well, to be secure in their indigenous identity, and to have their language so that no matter what happens in the future, where we're going, that they remain who they are. So that's a little snapshot. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Senator, I wonder, uh, your, your bill was entitled uh, using the o Oshetti uh, Sakowin Essential Understandings. What is it about those that uh, you think are important for, for um, uh, not just Native uh, 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 children, but non-Native children to, to learn? And what attracted you to immersive education uh, as someone, a former educator, lawmaker, parent? What, what's attractive to you about that concept? Well, 
is critical not only for our students but but for uh, mainstream students in South Dakota because it it finally gives a perspective of uh, you know the indigenous life and you know we're at, at some point if you're from South Dakota you are going to come in contact and you're you're going to uh, whether that's in a future job or uh, you know in in the grocery store or uh, anywhere else. Uh, you're going to come in contact with, with native people and what i what i hope to to bring out is that we're not viewed in a historical context it seems like that's the way we are continuously viewed is that we were once here and we're still here but they don't really understand that we're still connected to uh you know our culture uh, and this area so uh, being able to have those conversations uh, it is good for all kids. Um, and I think it gives them just a greater appreciation and it makes, it makes all kids uh, more of a well-rounded uh, individual, you know, going forward. Thank you, uh, Ms. White. I wonder, uh, this was a question uh, um, we began to talk about uh, on the phone the other day, but uh, the articles News Watch has done about Native education have garnered a very large audience and a lot of comments. And I think one of the questions that's asked in, in, in a sincere way by members of the non-Native uh, majority population is, uh, and this is a question that uh, could be asked in any state in the nation, I know from my own experiences, but when you have a, a Native child sitting next to a white child in the same classroom, same teachers, same materials, same curriculum, what is it that is preventing, in some cases, um, uh, any minority student from uh, uh, achieving the same uh, overall levels of success as a majority student? What is that? What, why, why are we seeing that achievement gap? I know that's a long and difficult question, but I wonder if you can uh, give, give a sense from your expertise of uh, uh, so someone who, who doesn't understand these issues can get sort of a grasp of why that is. Well, there are a host of intersectional variables, variables that would influence um, the outcomes of each of those students you're referring to. So I can't speak homogeneously about um, the European student versus um, a student of color in that space. But what I can say is this, um, in many spaces, especially urban centers across the United States and in South Dakota included, um, a lot of our students have what I guess what I would refer to as one of the elders in Omaha who I worked with um, mentioned is our students are searching actively searching for their spirit or their nagi which when you enter a space that doesn't validate your identity or the history and culture of your people then you start to believe that whatever identity you have is false and you start to feel like an imposter in that space and then the farther you go away seeking to fit into a box when you're a circle the farther you you have to become successful when we think about maslow's hierarchy of needs when those basic needs aren't being met there's no way for a foundational building block um, system to be developed. And I think um, self-actualization is among the top of that hierarchy. And in order to cultivate that, there needs to be um, more solidification or um, affirmation of cultural identity and things like that. And I would defer to um, Sage or Senator Heinert to um, add to that also. Gentlemen, if you're, you're free to do so. Um... Otherwise, I was going to ask uh, Mr. Cool, you uh, during your Senate testimony uh, and in our conversation, you had a, a you, you had a unique uh, personal experience with uh, as a non-native uh, with uh, um, sending your child to a, a, a native run and focused daycare. I wonder if you could just share a little bit about what uh, influence you think that uh, uh, placed upon your son and some of the the outcomes you've seen that uh, that uh, made you feel like that was uh, the right decision at the right time. Sure. So um, my son attended a Lakota language immersion Montessori school on the Pine Ridge Reservation that was a privately funded daycare uh, facility. And there's a few things at play that, you know, my son benefits from, but any student in that situation where they're having the opportunity to learn a second language um, is that one, it increases their ability, as Sage was talking about, to process things from a mathematical standpoint. Oftentimes, you'll hear people talk about uh, 
well, Lakota is not a language that's spoken outside of South Dakota, which is not necessarily accurate. But at the same time, developmentally for a child, where they're at in that early childhood education and as they're progressing through education, the ability to learn a second language really improves a number of different outcomes. Um, the other part that was important for his mother and I was just a, a difference in thought and philosophy. Uh, children are inundated these days at every turn and every step uh, from what we consider quote unquote dominant culture. And my son has had an opportunity to really look at the world in a different way, whether that be how he relates to um, Unchi Maka, Mother Earth, whether that be how he looks at plant and animal relatives. And I really think that it's provided a perspective in the way that he views the world that you can talk about from in a theoretical manner, but until you put a child in that space and they view their classmates as relatives, as they view their teachers as aunties and grandmas, um, that it just creates an entirely different mindset for, for a young person. And we were really blessed. And my son goes to a great pre-K now outside of, of Belfouche, South Dakota. I think it's great. I think it's not on par with what he was receiving. I happen to be down today uh, visiting Sage's school as well. And that's the experience that I want for my son again. Unfortunately, that's not a possibility where we live. So his mother and I supplement that as we can. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. That sounds great. Uh, Mr. Fast Dog, I wonder um, if you could share uh, uh, about your school on Rosebud, about the funding. Uh, one of the key elements of SB 139 was um, to provide uh, state funding. And I wonder why you, why you look at the state funding of the charter school, uh, the immersion charter school concept as so critical, given what you are experiencing at, and at your school. Yeah, I, I, that's the question, right? Why, why do we want state money? Why, what for? It's the same, same thing that any public school would want. You need money to sustain, sustain a business. And that's what education is, it's a business. So when I look at that in the lens of like that, with the K-12 system where one of my, two of my students are going to school, or two of my, or actually three of my kids are going to school, the, the academic output is 25% from K to 12. That's a lot of public money going into an institution that has been operating like that for about 60 plus years. That's because, that's only, being able to use public information about data that's there, we could probably go further back and you can still see the, see how much, um, you know, money is being put into a, a system that's supposed to help, help the people uh, that it serves. So and what, what this bill is asking for is an opportunity for local leaders, local education leaders to try it. To, and try to improve so that everybody has an equal opportunity. But as we're doing this, as we're, as we're going in the process, you get all these, all the, uh, the, the people that are opposed to it coming and attacking, attacking. But yet, when you look in their systems, none of them have a policy or a plan in their system for the indigenous population in South Dakota. And it's not there, it's not there, it doesn't exist. But yet, yet they're getting public funding. I mean, I'm a taxpayer. The family pays taxes. Every time I go to the grocery store, I'm mean, gonna pay property taxes too. So I think I think what's happening is more more South Dakota, more South Dakotans, uh, not even just in South Dakota, but anywhere else where Indigenous populations are are living. That there just be, needs to be more education around like. The idea, the idea of this school is that for human beings, we need an opportunity to have a place where we can learn. We need a platform that understands how the brain works. And this is, it, and when you're a teacher, your job is to take the content and convey it to the student. And currently, we don't have that. We don't have that supported throughout any of the universities in South Dakota because you only have to offer one indigenous ed course. And then you come to serve an Indian country and you're supposed to be prepared for that. 
So there needs to be more ongoing from some of the larger uh, institutes that are serving ed education to how can you indigenize a classroom? So if you have indigenous population, they have a better success rate. It's just about making connections to content. It's understanding how the brain works. It's taking a Eurocentric curriculum and then taking a look at the background knowledge of the students you're serving and how do you make connections with there so then it's understanding where the children come from, it's understanding their geography, it's understanding their politics, it's understanding their spirituality, their religion, it's understanding their economics. And when you have that, you are that much more prepared to serve any child in the geography you're serving. That's what, that's what this, uh, this school is, the, the bill is about. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I can say as a South Dakota, a relatively new South Dakotan, there is much to learn, but uh, the process of learning it and uh, the joy and the value in, in learning more about um, all of our neighbors is, uh, is uh, uh, one of the things I love about living here. Senator, I've got two back-to-back -back questions, uh, if you can uh, stay safe there while answering. Um, first of all, what's the risk of, of doing nothing or taking baby steps in terms of education reform uh, in, in South Dakota? You know, the risk of doing nothing is uh, you get the same results. Um, I think that's what we tried to bring forth in, in testimony. You know, really, what could this hurt? Um, well, we see the, the, the data that, that are coming out of uh, schools with indigenous populations. And, you know, it's time to try something else. Um, you know, I think we believe that that this is an avenue that that has uh, a lot of potential, and you know, I I can't understand why we wouldn't want to to take that chance when we know what we're currently doing is not working for all kids. Yeah, the, in a follow up to that, what the opponents testify is that the state law already allows for this kind of uh, um, reform to occur at the local level. That. Uh, there's uh, uh, the, the Sotomayor School, uh, language school in, in Sioux Falls, and now one class in Rapid City. I wonder, uh, do you think that the charter school concept itself, uh, uh, using state money, allowing local control over that school, uh, but trying different uh, innovations or, or educational methods, is that critical? Is the charter school concept critical to, to, to moving forward on Native Ed in South Dakota? You know, I, I think it it definitely would would give it a shot in the arm. Um, if if schools were able to do this, it's not like we have only been talking about this for uh, the last three years. You know, we our community has been asking for uh, to go down this road for for a long time. Uh, you know, we've recognized uh, many of the issues that uh, face our kids. So. Uh, the this the legislation itself, I, I think it, it actually gave schools some more freedom because they don't have the answers right now. It it hasn't worked, um, so why not turn over uh, some of that control to local, you know, educated leaders that are connected to the community that want good things for all kids. Yeah, I should note uh, that uh, in arranging this panel tonight, I did offer the opportunity to a couple of the main and most vocal opponents to participate. Uh, they both declined. Uh, their arguments during uh, uh, for our viewers, uh, if you weren't paying close attention, was that this would uh, possibly take a disproportionate amount of money away from the school districts that sponsor the schools. Also, there were some concerns about uh, uh, the governance and, and the way the law was written, uh, but uh, much of it probably uh, does come back to the, the funding. Uh, Ms. White, I'd like to ask you, you have a unique set of educational experiences in South Dakota, having worked uh, 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 for one of our uh, largest school districts and uh, now as a coalition. How would you, you know, and, and at Newswatch, we're not necessarily into assigning blame as much as we are to understanding issues and looking forward to solutions, but how would you gauge the efforts of the State Department of Education, individual districts and school boards or even the legislature and governor's office in the executive branch in terms of embracing or engaging in educational reform. My question I think ultimately is, is there a will among those in power in South Dakota to engage in real reform in native education? 
Um, that was a very loaded question. I think um, well, the one of the first things I would say is um, one of my peers and fellow mothers in the Rapid City Area School District um, made a testimony to the Rapid City School Board. It, was either one or two years ago and she was talking about the lack of consultation from the district to indigenous parents um, within our district and one of the questions she posed to the board was um, without without identifying any of the individuals indigenous individuals in this room how many indigenous parents did you have you been in contact with since you started serving your tenure on the rapid city school board and as you can imagine we heard crickets um, I don't think many school boards, if asked the same question, could identify um, more than a handful of individuals that they're talking to and before making these decisions. Um, additionally, I think there's a lot of challenges and misconceptions um, around what these schools were seeking to do. I think one of the biggest challenges I have, and this is directly relates into any, uh, like trying to um, push advocacy efforts because if advocacy efforts alone were enough to change systems to create the will and a opportunity to do things, things would have been done a long time ago. We're not the first generation of advocates. In fact, we stand on shoulders of predecessors who've been advocating to no avail in these spaces. Um, one of the interesting facts about the opposition is they talk about funding streams being um, taken away from the school in the same breath that they would endorse a bill that effectively allowed homeschool students who are not enrolled in the district or bringing any revenue into the district the opportunity to take take resources by engaging in um, extracurricular activities. Additionally, funding streams, as um, Senator B.J. Smith mentioned, um, the opportunity tax credit increase, which effectively increased appropriations for the opportunity tax credit benefiting public school or private schools, excuse me, which is effectively takes money away from the district, but it's really not the district's money. I mean, if we're tax paying parents, we have a right to have an autonomous decision in where our children are educated and how they're being educated. And I think that's the opportunity we're missing. Um, in South Dakota. We're not seeing choice as giving autonomy um, back to parents and moreover, frankly, autonomy, creativity, and innovation to our Indigenous educators who have done their due diligence um, to prove that they are experts in the field, that they have the credentials to do it. Um, they just need an opportunity to do it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, very diplomatic. Um, I wonder, um, uh, Mr. Cool, uh, you know, while it's troubling to, to look at the testing data, and I know testing data is a snapshot and, and uh, it's just standardized tests, but the, it is one metric that's useful, I think, to gauge uh, uh, how students are doing as a whole. But when you look at the achievement uh, for, uh, for, for white students in South Dakota, 59% uh, proficient in English, 49% proficient in math, only 48% proficient in science. I wonder if you think improving native education in South Dakota is a all boats rise kind of concept. Uh, um, I wonder if you can speak to the, the research and, and, and uh, um, data you have and personal experiences. I mean, would majority uh, students, would white students in South Dakota, and I know Senator talked about this, but uh, could, they, could we see improvement overall if there was some, some uh, uh, not continuing to do things the way they are, but but looking to innovate, maybe try some things, maybe try and fail at times, but but to 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 innovate and and try to improve things for for all students while improving things for native students. So I think what's occurred in this state for a long time as it relates to ind indigenous education it is a lack of innovation, and when we want to talk about what it looks like for all boats rising. Education in public schools, private schools, homeschooling, in large part in the United States is to prepare young people for the workforce. It's to ensure that they can become citizens who go out, get a job, contribute to a tax base, and ultimately build up the economies of where they are. And what we know is students who are not graduating from high school, students who are graduating with a substandard education, are those students who for the rest of their life are going to continue to access public benefits at a higher rate than their peers who go on to post-secondary education. 
Uh, and so in South Dakota, where economics maybe matters more to some folks than whether children are getting a, a culturally appropriate education, my argument to them would be, let's increase the tax base in the state of South Dakota. Let's make sure that the local economies of Rosebud, Pine Ridge, Standing Rock can grow. So then instead of pointing to the number of unemployed folks that are there, I don't know if it's causation or correlation, but when you look at education rates within the boundaries of native nations in the state of South Dakota, there's some pretty clear connections between there and what the economic outcomes for those areas are as well. So that's one way to look at it is from an economic standpoint. The other part too, at the same time, is that if we are in a space where we continually intergenerationally fail children and families, um, we're not seeing innovation. We're seeing a repetition of something that doesn't work. So why continue to be in that space? And I think one of the things that we've seen from the opponents is, well, there's this school that exists in Rapid City at Canyon Lake. Kudos to them. That's not enough. And we're not saying it has to be an either or. The parents that are on the advisory committee that the opponents cite on a regular basis have been very vocal that they support the efforts of this group as well. They point to Sage's school down on Rosebud and say, look at what's already possible. Between this group that's sitting here, we have close to 80 to 90 years of experience between public education and public policy. This is not us coming at this from some idea of, man, we hope we throw something to the wall and that it sticks. We've thought about it in good ways. We've thought about what the status quo is. And if that innovation doesn't occur, we're gonna to continue to see the same outcomes for the next 60 years. Yeah, well put, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Fast Dog, uh, um, this conversation, most conversations that talk about education and reform uh, come down to money for a lot of people. And I know that's important. Um, South Dakota is not a big spender. We're last again in average teacher pay in the nation. I wonder if educational reform or improvement has to, do you see it as something that has to be expensive? Um, do you see small things that you're doing there that are changing lives or, or improving things for children, families? I wonder if there are ways, if you could speak to any teachers or administrators watching now that you think that they could in small ways maybe take uh, make advancements in their district or in their classrooms to be more inclusive, to be more appreciative of difference to uh, help kids uh, uh, learn better than they are now? Does it have to be a multi-million dollar proposition? Yeah, does it cost you a lot of money to call a parent and ask them to what, what how they can, you know, be part of the education or academic plan? Does not cost a lot, just the phone call, even just the visit, maybe a little bit of gas money, but you know, you're probably gonna go back maybe like five miles, 10 miles, unless you're like in a rural area and you got to drive out a little bit ways, but that's all it's going to cost you is maybe, maybe um, it's going to cost you to use your heart because you got to make that connection with the families. When you bring them back where they belong, because they belong in that school, when they come back home, you're going to see those scores go up. Math, reading is going to go up. Because they're going to see us, they're going to see an institution that that no longer is an institution, but it's a, a second home, as it was supposed to be. That's so like that that can't that doesn't cost anything. That just that just means you're a teacher. That just means you're there. You're there to help that child be successful. You know that's and, and that's really what it is. That 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 just costs you just using your heart, using your heart and reaching out. And then when you learn from that, you know, as you go through years of experience, turn around and help another teacher that's coming in. Guide them in that same direction so that you're gonna make your school much more of a place for children to tell you every day, I love this school. I can't wait to come back. There's no school tomorrow, what? I wanna come back to, to school. When you get kids telling you that, daily then you know you created a good place for them when your families are calling they're excited about what's going on at your school and they're very involved 
you created a place for them to exist there. You cannot have a, you cannot have a great school without your without your community and your families involved. That's the biggest missing piece in our education system today. So, yeah, thank, thank you. you. No, I appreciate that, uh, Ms. White. I wonder, um, you know, you worked in the Rapid City School District. Uh, I, I was, uh, you know, personally as a, a resident and as a human being in South Dakota, disappointed to see that when the state surveyed uh, 700 educators in 125 school districts found that only 45% had used the uh, uh, essential understandings in any way and that 9% said their schools didn't celebrate native history or culture at all. Um, I wonder wh where does that have to, in your view, given your experiences, and what you're doing now, where does that change have to take place? What, what, what do we need to do to say, let's do some of the things that uh, uh, Sage just talked about, these little steps. Um, where does that lie? Is that the, the school board, uh, administrators, and individual principals, or individual teachers? What, what do you think is the key to making that, um, that, that, that uh, using those essential understandings, or maybe just being a, a more outwardly um, accepting, or, or bringing, bringing more kids in, rather than maybe uh, allowing for division? I think going back to what Sage just mentioned, the wealth of that knowledge is in the grassroots. So if, if, if school districts re reached out to grassroots communities more often for um, some of that consultation, then they would see some things flourish. But to answer your question directly, it definitely has to be a top-down approach at least, or, or teachers need to be given um, the freedom to be innovative and creative in their classroom spaces um, without fear of punitive retaliation if they're not teaching merely to the test. Um, in my experience, when we had administrators who bought into um, increased levels of cultural proficiency, the teachers and staff in that school automatically wanted to or showed a larger willingness um, to do more um, to bring that into the classroom spaces. Um, what is more from a global like grant making oversight, um, it, we really need Indigenous education to become an explicit strategic planning item across our school districts in Rapid City especially. I mean there have been advocates, myself included, on the um, senior leadership team who have been advocating for that explicit inclusion of Indigenous education throughout the fabric of that strategic plan. Um, we can't say that when designing plans that is it is inclusive of Indigenous families because it often is not. Um, and we see that with the Department of Education, for instance, too. I mean, the active erasure of, of our very being, not only from the department, but from our social studies curriculum reinforces that there's just not value placed in the integration and in, in inclusion of, of our people or the Ocheti Shakoin. So I think um, the answer is twofold. A, it has to come from leaders who value that and actively and explicitly do, do constructive things to make sure that's embedded. And then also there needs to be a lot more consultation and collaboration, not just from our tribal education leaders and reservations, but the stakeholders within the di very districts um, that schools are serving. Yeah, th thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Senator, I, one of the, some of the comments, again, in the devil's advocate role here, I think there's just some questions that um, might be helpful to answer in this, uh, this forum. Uh, people say this idea of making, uh, you know, and I know the schools are not just for Native students, but that, that this idea of, of Lakota immersion schools is more division. We're dividing people once again, rather than bringing them together. Can you address that? Uh, uh, um, because on the face of it, this would, you know, separate out uh, uh, Native education to a certain extent. Um, how, how do you, how would you address that, that, that comment that I see in some of the social media comments uh, uh, on our stories? You know, Bart, that's a, that's a great question. I sat through three hours of, of a hearing this morning talking about uh, divisive concepts, you know, a governor-backed bill. And what, what that was saying was, you can't talk about divisive concepts. And when, when you say that we don't want you to be able to teach in a relevant matter, uh, in a relevant manner, then, you know, you're, they're kind of speaking out of, uh, 
of both sides of their mouth. It's it's frustrating to see that uh, people imagine I think we're losing them there to, to, oh. to the, their, can you hear me? I'm sorry about that. Coming up. Yeah, you're back. Up. All right. Um, could you imagine if all public schools uh, taught to a majority of their population without relevance? I mean, that's what's happening to our kids. So that's all we're trying to do is create space for teachers and relevance. Then you can have a honor as an indigenous person and what it in today's world. Uh, that's that's the ultimate goal. Yeah, thank you. I, I wonder, uh, Mr. Cool, how do, how do you see, uh, now you're in a, 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 a you're off reservation now, you're in a, a rural area. How do you bring um, uh, even small steps forward for native students in uh, rural areas? Um, where maybe they might be even a smaller minority or maybe not on some reservation schools in rural areas. But how do you bring forward uh, some, some new ideas and thinking and reform in, in the rural areas of South Dakota? I think that's a really good question. I think one of the things to remember is even though I live outside the boundaries of a native nation, I do live within the boundaries of uh, the treaty and home territories of the Ocheti Shakoan. So you know, a lot of people who choose to say, uh, why can't Native folks get over it? They're quick to point to the Bill of Rights. They're quick to point to the Constitution. They're less likely to uh, focus on the treaties that the United States entered into on a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Native nations throughout this uh, country at the time. And so really for me, it's the opportunity to think about perspective uh, education is not new in Native communities. For a long time before the United States existed, grandmas and grandpas, moms and dads, aunties and uncles were teaching young people. Protocol is big among Native communities. What's relatively new is the idea of a Western education model. And let's be honest with each other, Western education models we're not designed in a way to benefit native and indigenous youth, whether it's in the United States or, or Canada. The whole idea between the educational movement in the United States from the time that the federal government recognized native nations was, was to tear down those communities and to do it at a space that was grounded in where young folks are at. And, and so I think a lot of times what happens is in the non-native AKA white community, uh, in South Dakota, if you're advocating for indigenous issues, you're, you're a liberal, you're a hippie, you're a whatever folks want to call it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if I believe in the Constitution, if I believe in the Bill of Rights, then I also believe in treaties. And I believe in things and promises that this federal government has made to Native nations. And so the opportunity to highlight that to young people, whether it's my son, will grow up learning about the Second Amendment, the First Amendment, and every amendment in between there, will also grow up learning about treaty rights. And I think in the state of South Dakota, where you've seen things like Harney Peak being renamed Black Elk Peak, or folks having an opportunity to have um, the chance to engage in more inclusive practices in this state, um, or, or something that are passing a lot of folks by. And, and it's really one of those things where when you find those folks, and I don't think it's just native kids, I think there's non-native kids as well there, to, to learn about the more inclusive and, and total history of this state than a better place we're in. Yeah, I appreciate that. Ms. White, um, so you're, you, you may be losing Senator Heinert uh, um, from, from office, but obviously there are other uh, senators and representatives uh, who support these issues, but what's next? Or what's uh, uh, suffered a defeat here this week, but where do you go from here? What's next on this, in this move, what, I, what I'm calling a movement, and I don't know if you see it that way, but certainly this uh, increased talk and discussion and, and hopefully ideas to, to, to improve Native Ed. What's, what's, what's next on, on your plate? 
before I move to what's next, I would like to preface by addressing what you what you addressed first and um, lo losing Senator Heiner in th at the state legislature is going to be one that we will feel um, for generations. But I will say that to Senator Heiner and many of us uh, have the opportunity and, and privilege to know this is that for Senator Heiner, his leadership doesn't stop when he's sitting in that seat up at the legislature. His leadership continues on a day-to-day -day basis with every action that he does in service of our people. So we won't necessarily lose him. Um, I know we won't. He's going to be a champion of efforts, um, regardless of where, where his path takes him. But I just wanted to make that clear. But definitely note that we will miss him in, in peer. Um, um, additionally, um, we are, I mean, the coalition, I'm excited to say, has formed into its own um, status, so a formal, a more formalized status. And so our next steps will definitely be embarking more on the movement. And I'm glad you mentioned it and called it a movement, because what we're really trying to do is apply theory to action um, when it comes to designing these equitable opportunities for our students. So our efforts aren't exclusive to the legislature, just like Senator Heinertz. I mean, we're working day in and day out on constructive outputs that our students will feel the effects of. And so definitely recalibrating, um, talking more about our legislative priorities moving into next year, and then for sure, keeping equity for our students at the forefront of all of our conversations and at the heart of what we do. So I don't know if that answers it, but that's kind of the gist in a nutshell. No, I appreciate that. I want to ask Senator Heinert the same thing. Um, Legislature is winding down. Your efforts there didn't bear the fruit that you had hoped. Um, can this become a community-based issue? Can this be something where communities or community members decide that I want to do something about this? I want to be part of this solution, as you call it, not part of the problem. Um, can that occur? How, how would that occur in South Dakota? Well, first off, I, I have to thank Sarah and, and all of the crew that has worked on there. I may have gotten lots of the press, but it's, it was really their efforts and their drive and their belief in me that, that helped uh, get as far as we did. So I, I could not have done that without them. Um, I think there is a, a, a groundswell of support for something like this. Um, I, I get emails, phone calls uh, every day from people who uh, wanted to, to help uh, offer testimony, sent emails uh, to legislators. And then uh, the emails that we received, uh, you know, after the bill went down, uh, some of them were, were very, very heartfelt emails. And these were, uh, Many times, you know, non-native people who who had a vested interest or or watched very closely as to, to what happened with this bill. So, you know, I'm hopeful that there are some very very smart uh, individuals going to to keep pushing uh, this effort. Uh, we've got uh, younger the younger generation is coming up uh, and and are able to tell their story. You know, they're they're able to to say, you know, I was in this system and I'm. I was successful in this system, but I could only imagine how good things uh, would be for me if I had another alternative. And so I think we, we can get there. Um, I'm not going to quit advocating uh, for this issue. Um, I will use every uh, connection and, and relationship that I have built uh, through my time in the legislature uh, to advocate for for our kids and, and for the state of South Dakota. Yeah, I appreciate that. I had sent you all a, um, a question I wanted to ask and uh, maybe we can stay with you, Senator. Um, a personal experience that you have, a story from your life or somewhat something that you've seen or, or know about that uh, touches you on this topic, that uh, um, makes you feel like uh, there, there's hope uh, that, uh, that, that things can improve, whether it's uh, slow and incremental or or we make some widespread change all of a sudden. But Senator, I wonder if you could start. Is there a story you'd like to tell so people uh, know on uh, 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 or can think about that, uh, um, that that meant a lot to you or means a lot to you? I think one of the uh, one of the blessings that that I've had in my in my life was being able to to teach all those years in Rosebud. 
and and I taught second and third grade. So I, you know, I I got them as second graders, kept them as third graders. So when you have a eight and nine year olds, and you can kind of help mold their mind or their uh, get them fired up about uh, their place in the world. I not too long ago I ran into a former student, and. Uh, they, they sent me a, an email. I, I saw they had done some uh, really great things. A uh, kid went on to be a national champion track runner, uh, All-American. Uh, and I, I sent him an email. Uh, he started his own company. And I just, to let him know how proud I was of him. Because I always thought he had uh, great potential. And in his email back, he said he learned, he got that drive from being in our classroom where he felt relevant and he felt validated. And I want to replicate that feeling for kids all over this state. Terrific. Thank you, Ms. White. Um, your personal story or uh, something that uh, uh, means a lot to you on this topic? I think the greatest source of inspiration for me, especially in the last few weeks, has been um, the youth movement that has um, come as a result of this. I, I'm thinking back to the Ochati Shakoin March for Our Children in response to the social studies revision process. And many of those students took it upon themselves to um, stand in solidarity with us in their respective locations. Um, and they're talking about this more at district levels. I think additionally, um, after the hearing um, on the, yesterday, geez, it seemed like a lifetime ago. After the hearing yesterday, we were doing a post um, hearing debrief and reflection with um, our young testifier, Miss Lorena, who was an 11 year old from Rapid City. And we, uh, we were reflecting about the opposition and one of the, one of, I think the most powerful statements that was offered during that reflection was by her. And she said, basically the opposition said, um, she said those against the bill. She said, basically those against the bill said, we don't deserve a school when they have thousands of them. And to me, um, that was really powerful. And she said, well, we're coming back next year. I know what to do now. And so I'm like, this is the source of inspiration. I mean, our youth are seeing it. It's just unfortunate that they have to be at the brunt of it as well. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mr. Cool. I know you shared about uh, your son's growth uh, in uh, uh, his uh, um, Lakota Immersion Daycare. Do you have another story that motivates you to keep doing what you're doing and continue to try to improve uh, um, education? I mean, I think it's what Ms. White mentioned earlier to this is that we've had lots of folks um, who we've been able to build on their work over the years, Senator Heiner, Deb Bordeaux, Dr. Sherry Johnson, um, a number of other folks who have really laid the groundwork for a generation of us who are now picking that work up ourselves and taking on those leadership roles. But what we're starting to see is a new group of young folks who are starting that at an even earlier age because they recognize the inequity that exists in the space of public education in South Dakota. They recognize the disservice that's being done to them, but also to their non-native peers as well. And they're being action oriented about that. And power is the ability to create change. You do that through organizing money. You do that through organizing people. And we've got a whole generation and a whole wave of young people who are looking to come together in that space to create change and to claim that power that is theirs. Thank you. I appreciate uh, all of those hopeful notes to uh, wrap our conversation tonight. I want to thank the panelists for being here uh, and for what you do. And also, I want to thank uh, all of our viewers who are watching live, but also the many more who will see this on their own time on uh, Facebook later. Uh, and remind everyone that uh, South Dakota News Watch, uh, all of our material is available for free for you to read and for all other media to use at no cost. It's all available at sdnewswatch.org. I'd like to wish everyone uh, a, a wonderful night, uh, safe travels if you're traveling, and thank everyone again for uh, all of your uh, efforts and attention, and uh, just wish everyone a good evening. Thank you, and that ends our broadcast.